Audrey Rose, and today we're going to be talking about Hegel's justification of Hegel, part 4, sections 14 to 17. And we have discussed how the state is the state of nature, the state of the present moment, the now. When Hegel has justified the now as a non-rational foundation for our thinking. And he has also made it clear that we need to think the now, which though it risks thinking the Lacanian real, if we do not think the now, we have no hope or little hope of being prepared for the future. For preparing for the future is not really a matter of thinking the future, but working on ourselves as a subject so that we might be prepared for whatever future might come. Like a expert artist stepping into a freestyle cipher, not knowing what will emerge in the cipher, but being ready for whatever might be the case. There is no other way to be prepared for the future in Hegel. Thus, the owl of Meneva flies, which does not mean philosophy cannot have an influence or impact on the world, but that it has an influence to the degree that it can resist the temptations of thinking a mistake was made in the past leading us to today, or thinking that the philosopher can make the future better if only he were to gain political power and political influence. The philosopher is to think now, but of course that means to think ourselves, and it is very difficult to think ourselves. Far easier to think some philosophical cathedral in which we can feel as if we are building something great and for which we can gain status. But this is not what Hegel would allow of us. He will force us to face ourself. But this is not hopeless. It's simply that we could view politi Hegel's political project, his social project, seems to have a lot to do with absolute knowing. We are limited to the now, but it is precisely this limit that we are the source of and thus have a degree of power over, and if we could choose it, we could choose to make our determinations necessities and thus f increase our freedom. It is these limits that are our power. And these limits are ones we must necessarily experience as limitless because we are limited from experiencing the limit, which thus makes us feel like we could design the future. But in fact, the limitlessness experience of the limits means that they are simply within the realm of our phenomenological experience from our experience as subjects and thus we have some control over them. No, we cannot make them vanish into thin air. We cannot make bookshelves turn into birds or things like that. But the limits move if only we would learn to move with them and choose them. This would mean that Hegel does not lead us to some Kantian kingdom of ends of rest and Sabbath where there is no tension. Hegel is leading us to a future that is ever tense, but it is precisely that tension that it creates creative possibility. The artist doesn't rest, and yet the artist finds fittedness in his or her work. An artist who doesn't have any more vision, who feels like there's no more books to write or project, is quite miserable or can feel miserable. Hegel would suggest that if we would align ourselves with artists, someone, some individuals, who could find a place in the phenomenology of the artist and define rest as the artist does, then we would find our proper place. And this would be a society of which negated and sublated its own efforts in the past to receive a final resting place and in fact found a great fitting place, a place where we can be creative. Now this isn't to say Hegel uses the language of artists or phenomenology of artists, that's my language, but I think we can think of what Hegel is suggesting as having something to do with the creative act or can more easily align with the creative act. Section 15 is going to explore the difference between spirit and state, which I find very interesting because in the, phenomena, the elements of the philosophy of the right, Hegel really talks about the state. And yet in Phenomenology of Spirit and Science of Logic, he talks a lot about spirit. So what is the difference? Well, first off, I'll note that we can look at the Phenomenology of Spirit as a sort of proof. And there's a piece in Reconstructing ASA called Fiction is the Mathematics of the Humanities. And what that argues is that if good fiction is X way, then there is reason to think that X has something to do with what humans ontologically are like. If good fiction constantly has irony, there'd be something to, th there'd be reason to think that irony is ontological. Well, likewise, in Hegel giving us an account of spirit developing through history that is a movement um, through failure reaching the limits and then transcending those limits toward absolute knowing where limit is recognized as essentially part of the development of spirit, then there would be reason to think that limitation is part of spirit. Likewise, if spirit is so developed that way, and spirit seems to be the notional version of state, 
then we should think of state as coming to terms with limits. Ergo, a role of the state is to help us come to term with to, to come to terms to be able to choose determinations as necessities, which would fall in line with the absolute choice. Um, a lot of this section 15 is going to be indebted to uh, Professor Restpal, W-E-S-T-P-H-A-L, who is quite brilliant. And I really like his book on history and truth and Hegel's phenomenology. It's a magnificent text. And I think what we can see, you know, he argues that the heart of Hegel's philosophy is the concept of the absolutist spirit. And the absolute is the recognition of its, ultimately the absolute recognizes itself as the constitution of its very limits. Um, and then comes to find fitness in that limit. This will also, um, he will make a point to us say that what we see then therefore is that spirit can be more associated with love. And love is interesting because that is where the I sees themselves in the other and doesn't, and yet doesn't erase the difference of the other. There's this absolute choice, I is other, and the state is the socioeconomic conditions in which it is becomes easier, or we see it as justified, to make the absolute choice of identifying I and other. So again, the state helps us make that choice. Westport, he tells us the spirit is what is absolute and only spirit's knowledge of itself can be absolute knowledge, which would suggest that if we can learn what the spirit is and how it unfolds, we will have gained absolute knowledge. That point where knowledge is no longer compelled to go beyond itself. Now, what seems to generate spirit is, in fact, a multitude of people, um, many people coming together. But the key is that it doesn't seem to be that it is that the spirit is merely a group, but a certain identification of people in a group with one another. Just because we have a group of people together, like strangers in the street, doesn't mean there's necessarily spirit. There are the conditions of spirit. But love is more adequate to the concept of spirit than life. So just because you have entities together alive doesn't mean that spirit emerges. It seems to have something to do with love. Um, Merold tells us the beloved is not opposed to us, but is one with our essence. We see only ourselves in the beloved whom we in turn nevertheless see as not ourselves, a wonder which we cannot comprehend. I think we can see in this the Christian Trinity where we have three persons, one essence. Likewise is spirit is when you have a multitude that identifies with itself to share in essence. And so the development of spirit through history corresponds with to the degree humanity can see itself as sharing in essence to relate in love. Now, this has to honor difference. It cannot erase difference. So that's why we don't end up with totalitarianism here. But it's defined by an openness to the other. If we're not open to the other, then whenever they try to interact, we kill one another like in Icelandic literature. And so society does not form. And so the state developing through history and progressing is is a development of love and a resemblance of humanity to the Trinity. The more humanity resembles the Trinity in sharing an essence of multiplicity, the more the state develops, the more the spirit, spirit develops. Now again, since Hegel is writing before nuclear bombs, there was no possibility of the world getting blown up. So it was um, practically inevitable through enough time, even if millions of years, that, that, that humanity would identify more so with the Trinity than less, therefore the spirit would develop more so than not. But now that is not so much given. Um, but the key here is that spirit is more like the Trinity than it is just a collection of people. And this is also how Hegel is going to try to justify the state and what emerges from it, not in terms of social contract. Um, the, the absolute choice of which is where humanity makes it, sees itself more like the Trinity, I other, um, is, is the absolute choice is the foundation, not some social contract. Hegel is not big on the, um, the social contract. Now this might all sound really mystical and strange, but I really like Marode Westpole's um, example. He talks about like a soccer team. And he writes, the manner in which the social whole may be said to be the ground and goal of human activity is relatively unproblematic. It is illustrated by the way in which a team is the ground and goal of an athlete's activity. The team is the ground of his activity as that without which he could not perform. You can't pitch without a catcher and the team is the goal of the athlete's activity in that it is the team's success that finally matters most. Being voted most valuable player is never a satisfactory substitute for the team's winning its way to the World Series or the Super Bowl. Now, is soccer concrete? You know, is a team a concrete reality, like a state? I absolutely think so. And yet it's strange because it exists between the abstract and the concrete, but it seems ridiculous to suggest that during a game of soccer, there are not concrete rules. Um, there's not a concrete setting. There's not a concrete team. 
um, that it has some sort of existence of some nature that everyone there can identify. Now you could get into the debate of if universals and generalities exist, but someone doesn't have to be a philosophy major, they can just be a kid off the street and they'll treat the Socrates as if it's real and that's enough to make the point. It is a real social reality. And this is spirit. This captures spirit. Is there not something like spirit in um, a team? Is there not some sort of identification of I and other in team? And this is um, this is what we're looking for. This is this is this is what kind of captures spirit, of which is simultaneously state. There is a the players are concrete. They're like the state where the spirit is the soccer game. There's an abstract and there's a concrete, but they're inseparable. So the state is the natural expression of spirit, while the spirit is the notional expression of state. Another way to put it is the state is the nature of the spirit, while the spirit is the notion of the state. And these are inseparable because it's A, B. There's no players without the team. There's no spirit without the state. They are connected in profound ways and the reality of one is dependent on the other and they exist in a tension there. But that tension is life. That tension is necessary for the very creative possibility of soccer. So again, the state is the natural expression of spirit and the spirit is the notional expression of state and the terms nature and notion are very important in Hegel. And indeed, we have this question in the science of logic of the relation of nature and notion and if they have an isomorphic structure. If so, that would give us reason to think that if we can follow the development of thought, then we will achieve real knowledge, actual knowledge about nature, even if indirect somehow. Um, so the state and the spirit relate in this manner. The next sections are going to be talking about the concept of return, return as such, how Hegel is always dealing with not mere return, but the RE in parentheses, where we return to the place of our beginnings and know it for the first time, as we find in Hegel. And this would also tie with um, Hume's common life. This would also tie with some of the Kyoto School's pure experience, where we start in a state where there's no subject-object divide, then we enter a subject-object divide, and then we return to where that divide is gone, in a Heideggerian sense, but also a Hegelian sense, and yet the return is not the same. And this return seems to be the development of state and the development of spirit. State is returning to itself. Um, absolute knowing is something always already. The state is always spirit and it is always already in the and spirit is always already state, but it cannot know itself as such without this phenomenological journey, without this philosophical realization. And so it has to go on this journey so that it can return to itself and fully know itself. And this makes me think of Hume's um, uh, return to common life. If we don't return to common life, we fall into autonomous rationality and become a force of destruction. And so what we see in Hegel is a state is is spirit returning to an understanding of itself so it can see its role in the state and feel justified by the state because we've talked throughout the other sections why the state gives us justification for thinking the now and thus the spirit always has justification for thinking the now of itself. However the spirit is now, the spirit is justified to be. And in being able to assume that justification, spirit can then develop according to what has emerged now, which is Hegel. This is Hegel's justification of Hegel. That would then lead reason to going into the phenomenology of spirit text, and that would lead you to the science of logic. So that is a justified effort, thanks to a justification of the state of now found in the philosophy of right. And indeed, if this um, justification has emerged now, doing this is imperative. So Hegel has also added imperative to studying Hegel. Um, if we don't do it, we probably won't be able to handle the now and um, carry ourselves in the matter that the now needs uh, so that it does not end up a face, but rather is negated and sublated into the next phase. So we have justification of Hegel and we have imperative uh, to study Hegel, both and the same goes with philosophy in general. Um, to bring, the, to bring the work with a close, um, it's important to, again, just stress that the state is to help us choose our determinations into necessities, which we can only do now, which we can only do by not trying to avoid um, the now. We have to face the now. And, and again, what we find in Hegel is not really a utopian project. Zizek puts it well in Less Than Nothing when he says, It is true that one finds in Hegel a systematic drive to cover everything, to propose an account of all phenomena in the universe in their essential structure. But this drive does not mean that Hegel strives to locate every phenomenon with a harmonious global edifice. On the contrary, the point of dialectical analysis is to demonstrate how every phenomenon, everything that happens, fails in its own way, implies a crack, antagonism, imbalance in its very heart. Hegel's gaze upon reality is that of a rotogen apparatus which sees in everything that is alive the traces of its future death. But this precise 
Instability is the necessary condition of creative possibility. And this instability is why there is an opening in us according to which we can choose the other. Without that, without that opening, why would we choose the other? And without that opening, there would be no reason to think that we are I, other, and A, B. The opening is the invitation. And the state gives us reason to assume the realization that the opening, the wound in us is an invitation, is a justified position. And thus the act of choosing the other is a justified act. And in fact, it is the act that we today need to carry out. It is the choice that we today need to make so that we can arise to the occasion of the now. So we can prove ourselves worthy of the place that spirit has brought us, that the state has led us with one another so that tomorrow can come precisely because we've proven ready for it today. Yes, Hegel tells us that the owl of Nineveh has taken flight, but this does not mean we aren't still standing on the ground watching the owl soar, able to use our hands for work. We can look down back onto Nineveh's tree and notice a nest. There is an egg, an egg which will need to be nurtured. The future is not over yet. For more by O.G. Rose, please visit ogrose.com for the complete um, series on Hegel's justification of Hegel Tech Medium, and you can find them all on YouTube, the audio summaries, and thank you so much for your time.